The gentleman that I was traveling with was Dr. Howard Carter of London, England, uh, who had a Bible college there with the president of a Bible college that sent people all over the world to minister. It was a kind of a world a Bible training uh, institute. And he would tell me other things about this Smith Wigglesworth until finally I wanted to meet him more than anybody else. That There was an eagerness inside of me to hear and see Smith Wigglesworth. When we arrived in England, after we'd been together all through Australia and all through the Orient, and all through Europe. We came across Siberia and Russia and went through Europe. We finally got to England, and we got there the week before the National Conference. And Dr. Howard Carter uh, was the uh, convener of the conference. He was the chairman of the conference. So he asked me to speak in the evening because I'm an evangelist. He asked, he asked Smith Wigglesworth to speak in the afternoon as he was a teacher. And, and so I was teamed up with him the first week I was in England. I was teamed up with a man I wanted to meet. And, and uh, he, he wasn't easy, you know. He, he, he was sit like a statesman, even in, in church, just like this, listening intently to whoever was there speaking and, and so forth. And so uh, I arrived in the late afternoon, so he heard me first. So I preached that night and gave the altar call. Being a convention, there weren't many that got saved because most of the people were preachers and so forth. But I, I, I gave an evangelistic sermon, gave the altar call. When I was through and turned around on the platform, there was Smith Wigglesworth looking at me. He put his hand on my shoulder and said, Son, you need to come see me. Well, I, I'd been, you know, called into the principal's office when I was in school, and I knew what it meant to face the principal and work on a problem. And that's what it sounded like, that he needed to see me to correct me. And I said, yes, sir, when can I come? He said, any time. He says, I live in Bradford. Here's my address and my telephone number, and says, you can come. I said, how often can I come? He said, you can come as often as you want to. Uh, these days, I'm at home. Now, I lived in England for two years, and within a week after that, I was on my way to Bradford. Now, anywhere you preached, you know, in the British Isles. You had to go through Bradford anyway. It was in the Midlands, right in the center, and so it was very convenient to, to buy a ticket to Bradford and then to buy a ticket to east or west or north or wherever I wanted to go. It was so easy to do that. And, and so I went to see him. I found his house, and, uh, and, and, and I hit the, the, the doorbell, you know, the door locker, knocker. They didn't have an electric doorbell. It's one of those ancient things that you uh, take a piece of metal and hit it against a piece of metal, you know, uh, a knocker. And so I knocked on that thing and then stood up and waited for him. Now, if you had seen me then, you would have laughed. Because by this time, uh, with the British people, I, I looked like them. And, and I talked like them somewhat. And I had on a bowler hat. If you don't know what a bowler hat is, it's a Charlie Chaplin hat. And, and I had on, I had, had on a, 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 a black jacket and, and striped uh, trousers and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a blue, dark blue top coat that came just above my knees. And I had an umbrella on, on one arm and I had a newspaper on the other arm and my briefcase in my hand, my Bible case. So there I stood, you know, and <laughs> Smith Wigglesworth opened the door and glared at me. He didn't say good morning. He didn't say, how do you do? He said, hoots under your arm. That means what is under your arm. I, this, this side was an umbrella on my arm, and the other side was a morning newspaper under my arm. I said, the morning newspaper, sir. He said, throw it away. Throw it away. You can't come in here. You can't come in here. <laughs> and, and I said, yes, sir. So I took it and stuck it in the bushes and stood back up to see if there's something else, you know. And, and uh, he looked me over. I said, come in. So I came in. He took my coat. We went into his living room, which was the first room over to the right, and, and had a, he had a coal fire on, and it was very cozy. And uh, rather than asking me where I came from, where I was going, he said, I was just reading. <laughs> and he read a half an hour from the Bible. And then he said, let's pray. He knelt down and prayed for another half hour, but he laid hands on me and he prayed and said, God bless him. God bless him. <laughs> I was really glad when he got through, you know, and he said, I want to read you some more. So he read the Bible for another half hour, and then he said, let's pray again. And so we, we got down and we, we prayed again. And I said, Lord, what did I get into here? 
what did I get into, you know? And, and so uh, about that time, his beautiful daughter, Alice, that we were telling you about, uh, she had prepared a beautiful uh, a luncheon, and so she called us uh, to lunch, Yorkshire pudding and, and, and roast beef and, and that beautiful gravy that they put on it there. It, it was something, and, and, and peas that you pick up on the back of your fork rather than the front. And, and so we had a, a delicious lunch, and when he got through, uh, he just put his napkin on the table and said, uh, uh, come back again, and walked away. His daughter explained that he had gone to get some rest, and so I, I, I thought that was a signal to leave, and so I asked for my coat, and I left. Before I'd walked a block, I said, you know, I got something there. I, I, I'm different. I, I got something. I received a blessing. I, I received an anointing. Something good happened to me in that place. I said, I, I'll come back again. And so about 10 days later, I went back. Oh, yes, I, I, I had on my little, little dark blue uh, raincoat, and, and I had my umbrella uh, and my bowler hat, but I didn't have any newspaper. He, uh, when he saw a newspaper, he said, I don't permit those lies into my house. He says, in my house, there's only truth, and that's full of lies. Leave it outside. And so I just obeyed and, and did what he told me to do. And I went 10 days later, and then I went again two weeks later. Then I went again two weeks later. I continued to go to his house. I continued to listen to him read the Word and listen to him pray and hear him tell of the mighty miracles the mighty miracles that God had done for him around the world. And my faith began to mount up, to mount up, you know, strong. My faith began to mount up in, in the presence of this man. We became good friends. When, when he had a convention, he would ask me to speak, to be a speaker in his personal convention and, and over in the city of Preston. And I, I, I accepted it. I was very delighted for that. We would meet in other conferences, and then I would go and see him. Now, in all the two years that we were having this fellowship, I, 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 never, I never met another visitor at his house. And not, not one time. So they weren't standing in a long line to get Smith Wigglesworth's faith. And there may be those that are, admire him today, but I didn't see you there. Uh, when, when, when I was there. And, and so uh, they weren't seeking after Smith Wigglesworth at that time. But I was an American and, and a young man, and I wanted what this older man had. He intrigued me. He, his bluntness intrigued me. And his depth of, of sweetness, you might say. It was like a well of water springing up, and it was so delicious until I would come and drink again and again and again. And so we had some very precious times of fellowship uh, with, with Smith Wigglesworth. Two things I'd like to, to, to tell you about it. One is that I was in England when the war broke out uh, in, in 1939, living there. I had preached all over the continent. We, we, we knew what was coming. Everybody knew what was coming. And I preached in Germany. Uh, with, with, with Hitler's uh, Gestapo men in every meeting that I spoke in and so forth. And so uh, we were very conversant to Europe. It, it was, the, it was the, the cockpit of the world and about to explode. And it did explode in, in 39. And I was there, and Hitler's armies were, were, were moving out, and they went through Belgium and through Holland and into France. And the British government sent a special agent to my, to my room in London, I was living at the Bible school, a and said, we will be next, and we will have to send you out of the country. This is now a war zone, and, and you are a visitor here, you'll have to leave. So I was told by the British government that I would have to leave uh, England. And so I had to go tell some friends, and one of them was, was Smith Wigglesworth. So I, I went up to his home again, and now we were old friends. We had a lot to talk about. He had blessed me in so many ways. He had discussed the Word of God with me in, in, in so many wonderful sessions together. 
uh, until I was always eager to get there, and he seemed eager for me to come. Because at that time, I would be 25 or 26, and he would be maybe 85, you see. And, and that, that, is a, that is a difference. It's like an Abraham and an Isaac, you see. It's, it's like a Paul and a Timothy. And so I broke the news to him. I, I said, uh, uh, Brother Wigglesworth, I, I will not be seeing you now. I have to leave because of the war. And the government has told me they've given me so many days to get out of the country. And, and so I will be going back to America and on to other countries to preach the gospel. And said, so the fellowship, the fellowship with you has, has been very rare. Uh, only a person like Howard Carter or a person like Donald G. has, has blessed me equal to blessing that I've received from you. And I humbly thank the Lord and thank you for giving me so much of your time and, and letting me hear you talk to God in your prayers and to hear you read the living Word of God and, and how it comes alive within you. I am so grateful and I'm so thankful. And, and now I will have to leave. He, he stood up uh, on his feet and tears began to flow down his face. Now, now, he looked like what you'd call, you know, a Philadelphia lawyer or a Boston banker between the two. Never a hair out of shape, so groomed so perfectly and so beautifully. Uh, he was a very un unusual person. And, and he, he stood up there like a general, you know, and he says, I want to bless you. And I said, yes, sir. He had done that a lot of times. And he laid his hand over on me and pulled me close to him and I let my head go in closer to him. And, and from his eyes, uh, tears came and ran down his face and dropped off onto my forehead and ran down my face. And he, as he cried, says, Oh God, God, let all of the faith that is within my heart be in his heart. And, and and let the knowledge of God that resides in me also reside in him. And that all the gifts of the Spirit that function in my ministry, let them function in, in his life. I, I just stood there weeping. And he stood there praying and, and, and weeping, holding me in an embrace uh, to him. And I felt the holy anointing of the Most High God as it, as it flowed from Him into me. Now, I have been blessed by a, a number of great men, and I'm so thankful for it. To, to go around the world when I was so young and to meet the great men of the whole world and a hundred nations of the world, you know, was a real honor. And so, I, I appreciated it so much. And, and as he broke the embrace, he said, you will be blessed, and faith will reside within you, and you will do unusual things. I, I presume it was a kind of a prophecy. And, and then he said, I wish to tell you something. And I said, yes. Oh, he says, I see it. His eyes were burning like Elijah's eyes when he saw the chariot of the Most High. His, his face, his face was so strong as he was looking at me and saying, I see it. And I said, what do you see? He said, I see revival coming to planet Earth. He says, I see revival coming to planet Earth, maybe as, as never, never before, as never before. I, I see revival coming. He says, it would be untold numbers and untold, uncounted multitudes that will be saved that no man will say so many, so many, because nobody will be able to count those that will come to Jesus. And, and I, I just stood there, and he was prophesying and seeing a vision, because he said, I, I see it, I see it. He said, the dead will be raised. He said, the arthritic will be healed. He said, cancer will be healed. And and he began to tell me of the mighty things that no disease would be able to stand before God's people and that it would be a worldwide situation, not local, but it would be a worldwide thrust of God's power and thrust of God's anointing upon mankind. And I was 
listening so intently to it. And then he, he opened his eyes and looked at me, and he said, uh, I will not see it, but you shall see it. And that was the end of it. You shall see it. I'm expecting to see, and we're beginning now at this time to see the move of God such as planet Earth has not seen before. That will, that will be so much greater than 2,000 years ago when the church was born, a greater in magnitude because of the communications we have today. With our short wave that we have reaching, reaching over 100 nations of the world right now, and over 1 billion 300 million people. We're believing that short wave to bring in 100 million souls into the kingdom. You see, 100 million souls into the kingdom. Thank God for every one of you that helped us to put it on the air. It's beaming out there. We've already had, had letters from, uh, from uh, 76 nations on the face of the earth. 76 nations on the face of the earth and giving their hearts to God and telling us how much they appreciate the ministry of God's Word into their hearts. And so, even though it's a new station, it, it's bringing back the fruit, and we're so delighted, and we're so, so thrilled, and we, we rejoice. We rejoice so much in it. But the great revival is just in front. And there's only one thing I wish to share with you so strong. Most people are not able and not capable of going from blessing to blessing. Most denom all denominations and most people uh, die in the same first revelation they receive from God. Uh, the people that call themselves Lutherans today are living in the same blessing that Luther had 400 years ago, you see. The, the people that call themselves Wesleyans and Methodists, they're living in the blessing of Wesley a couple of hundred years ago, you see. It's very difficult to get out of a groove. It's very difficult, you know, to get out of a system. You have so many friends there, and you've had so much fellowship there. There's a man in the Bible that has to be appreciated tremendously. Uh, Andrew is his name. Andrew was a Baptist, belonged to the Baptist church. John Baptist was his pastor. And he loved it. His spiritual revelation came from John Baptist. He walked with him, went wherever he went. Though he lived in Galilee, he was away down near the Dead Sea uh, with John Baptist, enjoying the teaching and enjoying the blessing. When one day this John Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. And Andrew saw Jesus. He said, I must decrease, he must increase. He looked at his pastor, and he looked at Jesus. And something happened. He decided not to be a Baptist anymore. Now, nobody told him to. John did not turn him out, and Jesus did not take him in. Something inside of him said, this is a little son. That is a big son. Something inside of him said, hey, this is a blessing. This is a super blessing. And so he ran away from John Baptist without looking back and ran toward Jesus and followed Jesus. And Jesus said, what do you want? He says, I'm following you. He found him about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And all that evening and night, Jesus expounded to him the kingdom and of his sonship with the Father. And he believed. That young man ran he ran. He said, Jesus, don't go anywhere. I'll be back. He ran from close to the Dead Sea by the Jordan River all the way to Galilee to find his brother Simon. And as soon as he found him, he said, Simon, we have found the Messiah. Whew, what a testimony. What a testimony. They had been looking for the Messiah for a long time. This young man had found him. And old Peter, possibly mending a net, looked up and said, you found what? He said, the Messiah. Something in his eyes, something in his face. Peter believed and went with him and met Jesus. 
and became a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you be able to move out of the blessing you have now into a, a bigger blessing? Are you going to call them fanatics because you don't have it? Are you going to say they don't act like I do and they don't sing like I sing? You've got to get ready for the new. But Brother Wigglesworth told me, he said, I will see it. He would not see it, but I would see this colossal move of the Holy Ghost, this amazing move of the Spirit of God, <laughs> that I would see it. And I believe it's beginning to happen right now. And I'm ready for it. I will move into any channel God wants me to move in. I will be anything He wants me to be. I'm ready to get out of the groove into another groove. I'm ready to be anything God wants me to be because I want what God is doing in my hour. I want to be what God prefers that I be. The problem with millions of Christians, they receive what is good, but they don't receive what is best. And there's the answer. You may have what is good. Do you have what is best? In your work for the Lord, there are ministers that do what's good, but do they do what's best? You got to decide what's best. That's what God wants us to do. That's what God wants us to be. And so I urge you to be part of it in Jesus' name.